Hello, this is part two of the video discussing um, Attribute MSA. And in this section, we're going to talk about what is commonly referred to as intra and inter rater agreement. And if you were to do something like a Google search on this topic of inter rater agreement, uh, you would be overwhelmed with the volumes of information. Uh, the things we're going to talk about in this section um, apply to a wide range of applications. Education, defense, medicine. Uh, it's hard for me to think of an area where it doesn't apply. So in this particular scenario, we're not going to talk about accuracy anymore. In fact, we will, in many cases, uh, have no basis for assessing accuracy. But we still want to see how well an appraiser or rater agrees with his or herself and how they agree with each other. And this sometimes is uh, put in terms of concordances and discordances among the raters. Okay. okay. So in... Um, intra and inter-rater agreement, you might consider this uh, an analog to repeatability and reproducibility. Okay. And in our particular case, we can do repeatability, that's intra-rater agreement, but there's no way to completely separate um, the analysis of intra-rater agreement and inter-rater agreement. So unlike continuous MSA, we can't completely separate the repeatability variation and the reproducibility. I don't think this is a serious um, impediment to doing the analysis, but it is a technical point. Uh, there are people working on ways of trying to separately assess inter and intra-rater agreement, but so far, published methods are rather theoretical and, in some cases, downright impractical. Okay. So how do we measure agreement? In other words, we have some set of units or samples. We have someone appraising them, and typically more than one person appraising them. That is, correctly classifying them. Well when we talk about how well does a person agree with themselves, well, they would have to come back and reappraise uh, the samples or units a second or third time. I typically recommend no more than two times because after that you typically start to see a learning effect take place. In other words, they start to remember um, the exact uh, uh, rating they, get, they have given previously to the different units. So inter-rater is agreement between raters, but again, we can't completely separate the intra-rater effect from the inter-rater. As I said, reproducibility and repeatability are not completely separable in this study. But one of the issues that, that many people have um, is they, they have a naivete about the ability to actually um, match or agree. In other words, it's actually quite surprising how well, say, two or more appraisers agree by random chance. Okay. Uh, if you think of it, suppose I had two coins, you know, heads or tails, and I toss each coin and I measure how often they come up with the same uh, head or tail. In other words, both are tails, both are heads. Well, if you think about it, that should happen 50% of the time. So if I toss two coins a large number of times and I see uh, they, the two coins agreed 50% of the time, well, guess what? That doesn't mean that there's any mechanism of agreement between the coins. That's simply random chance. So we're going to have to come up with a way of measuring the level of agreement that somehow adjusts for random chance alone. There is no perfect measure. Uh, one that's commonly used is called kappa. There are some variations of them, but the one we're going to use is uh, a very common one. Uh, 
and it traces its origins back to the 1960s. I'll say up front, kappa is not a perfect measure, but so far it is the most commonly used and is the most practical. So to give you an example, I'm on uh, slide 18, and we're looking at some contingency tables. There are three of them. And this is where two raters, for instance, um, Frank and Mary, uh, each rate 100 objects, and we look at how often they agree. Well, notice they both passed 40 parts, and they both failed 10. So they're in agreement 50% of the time. You might think, well, that's pretty good. But we have to be careful because that may well have been chance agreement. Okay, do they really have any inherent ability to agree, or is this just random agreement? And we look at David and Cephas. Similarly, they agree 50% of the time. Okay. By the way, notice the distribution of the errors in the off diagonals are different. And then finally, let's just take a look at Verl and Virginia. They also agreed 50% of the time. But again, look carefully, and you'll see in the off diagonals, in all three cases, um, the cases where they didn't agree, the discordances, had very different distributions. And that'll come into play when we calculate kappa. So here's what we want to know. Adjusting for random chance, do these three pairs of raters have any actual ability uh, to agree? As in other words, is there any inherent agreement, or are we looking at random phenomena? Okay. Well, let's kind of do some quick calculations. Notice that Mary classified 50% of the units as passed. Okay. Notice Frank classified 80% as pass. Okay. So if Frank and Mary are just randomly agreeing, what are the chances that they both would pass something just at random? Think of this like tossing two coins. One heads has a 50% chance of happening. The other is not a fair coin. It has an 80% chance of agreeing. So I toss the two coins. What are the chances that they're both going to be heads? The answer, 0.4 or 40% of the time. Well, take a look. That's exactly how many times they agreed. In other words, this is starting to look like they agreed 40% of the time, partly because Frank tends to pass everything. In other words, think of it as a coin where you get heads a high percentage of the time. So at random, again, think of the analogy of tossing two coins, one 0.5 times you'll get heads, the other 0.8. You toss them both. They literally should agree 40% of the time, unless you were tossing the coins in such a manner that tend to make them agree. In other words, you didn't toss them fairly. Okay. And that's where we're heading. We now know 40% of the time okay, they should agree at random. How about feeling. Well, we can do a similar calculation. Okay. Uh, Mary failed 50 of them. Frank, 20. So if we take 0.5 by 0.2, again, think of it as tossing two coins. You should get, um, say, tails. They should both get tails 10% of the time. That's exactly what they did. Here, intuitively, uh, is what's going on. It looks like the agreement between Frank and Mary can be entirely attributed to random chance. Okay. So how do we measure that? Well, we can go through 
for any of these scenarios using the method I just showed you and do the same calculations. In other words, think again the scenario of tossing two coins where the probability of heads and the probability of tails can be different. So here's David and Cephas. I do all the same calculations. Okay. So notice uh, Cephas passes 65% of the parts. Okay. And David passes 65% of the parts. So how often are they to likely agree? So think of it as tossing two coins where the probability of heads is 0.65. They should agree a little over 42% of the time. Well, that's actually pretty close to the observed of 40, so we're beginning to look like maybe they don't agree so well. Well, let's take a look at the two cases, uh, or the case where they both passed. Again, uh, they passed together mutually 10 of the units. And notice David fails 35%. Cephas fails 35%. So we would expect about a little over 12 on average, pretty close to 10. So intuitively, it looks like these results also are probably random. In other words, once I adjust for the effect of randomness, there's not much left. So I can't really say that David and Cephas actually have any underlying or inherent agreement. This may be just a random result. Okay. So this leads us to the calculation of what's called kappa. Okay, and we use these expected counts, and I showed how they're calculated, to come up with the kappa statistic. Okay, so the number of units where David and Cephas agree by chance, again, this is, you know, statistically 54.5. Okay, they actually agreed on 50. So the differential, uh, I'm sorry, what did I say? They actually uh, agreed and disagreed uh, 40 and 10 versus 42.5 and 25 and 12.25. In other words, you just subtract uh, the observed from the expected and you get a minus 4.5. So that's the difference, the total difference between what you observed and what you would have expected at random. Okay. So what we observed was just slightly less than what we would have expected at random. Okay. Now compare this okay, to the number of observations total minus the agreement. So that's 45.5. Okay. So we expected them to agree on 45.5 of the units. Okay. So you take the, the difference between the observed and the expected and divide it by um, the number of units where we expected agreement, okay, and that gives you uh, almost zero. It's a little less, minus 0 0.9. Okay. And that's called the kappa statistic. You don't have to worry about going through all the calculations, but it's chance-adjusted agreement. Okay, so basically, you know, in the study, what we discovered is that we expected them to actually, and by the way, I want to be sure I said this correctly, we expected them to disagree, okay, 45.5% of the time. Okay, they, we expected them to agree on 54.5, so you take the difference between the observed and the expected, and you divide it by the expected number of disagreements, and that percentage actually gives you what we call kappa. Okay, and that's explained on the next slide. Again, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, jump calculates it. So for David and Cephas, uh, jump calculates the kappa coefficient. The key for you is to understand it's the amount of agreement. Okay.
over and above random chance, how much real agreement exists. So what are considered good values of kappa? Well, this statistic has been in use for a very long time, and there are established uh, guidelines that are used. Again, I think it somewhat depends on the application. But in general, anything over 0.6 is considered acceptable. Remember, this is chance-adjusted agreement. Okay, so this is a pretty severe criteria. So if you can get above 0 0.6, that's generally considered acceptable. If you can get above 0 0.8, which I frankly don't know that I've ever observed, in reality, that's considered outstanding. In other words, if you can get a chance-adjusted agreement above 0 0.8, that is close uh, to perfect. Again, kappa is um, not a perfect statistic itself, but it is useful, and we do have a lot of history in its use, um, and it's easy to understand. So until somebody comes up with something else that is actually useful and understandable and easily applied, this is basically what a statistic most people use is kappa. So let's go back and look at our scenarios. And notice we had a kappa of 0, 0.2, and a little under 0. So basically, what that tells you is these three tables represent random agreement. Doesn't look like these pair of raters have any real inherent agreement between them. This is just random chance. Okay. Well, you can do um, agreement in jump in the variability chart platform. Okay. So basically, if we go back, actually I'll do this in a moment. I'll go to jump. So remember, Kappa looks at, uh, can look at repeatability and reproducibility, but there's no simple mathematical way to completely um, separate the two. So let's look at radiology agreement. Okay. So again, this is similar to what we looked at before with the radiologists. But this time, we ask each rater to come back and redo the images. In other words, they'll do one session, uh, review the images, they'll come back at some future date and redo them, and typically they're presented in random uh, order each time. Now we can measure repeatability or intra-rater agreement and reproducibility or inter-rater agreement, but we can't completely separate the two, unfortunately. Okay. So again, we can um, look at the contingency table. By the way, JUMP will supply you with the expected counts. We're not going to worry about that. Go to the variability chart platform, and notice uh, the inter, I'm sorry, intra rater agreement. Okay, so there's rater 1. How well did he or she agree in rater 2? So we do all possible combinations. We really don't have any way out of it. Again, there's no simple mathematical way to separate the two components. But you can see that neither rater seems to have much ability to agree. At this point, I would stop. Notice there was one case, rater 1 versus rater 2, where the kappa got up to almost 0.4. Um, but given the two raters can't agree with each other, that's obviously just a random occurrence. In other words, there's no real evidence of agreement. So at this point, we would conclude that neither, neither of the raters has the ability to reproduce their results. In other words, they can't repeat their results. Okay. <clears throat> so let's go take a look uh, at JUMP, and then I'll show you one more case study. Okay, so this is the uh, Kappa study. So again, we would go to Analyze, Quality and Process, Variability Gauge Chart. 
and I'm just going to put in all the rating columns and the grouping is by case number. Again, I'm only going to focus on a small part of the output and that output, the only thing that really matters here is the agreement comparisons. So again, you take a look at the kappas, uh, almost zero. Uh, the intra-rater agreement in both cases is nearly zero. At this point, I stop and I say, well, it's obvious they can't agree with each other. Okay. And I'll show you one more example because you can use um, the kappa statistic and you can do agreement studies with more than two categories. In fact, you can do um, expert reevaluation with more than two uh, categories if you want to. And in this case, we have a um, study called surface defects. So there are four types of defects that can occur on the surface of a part. Scratches, cracks, dents, and D is a category that means the quality is so bad we can't really determine uh, the exact primary defect, so we're just going to call them D. Okay. So again, we have uh, Raiders agree, um, do an agreement study with 50 parts, and in each part, please classify the primary defect that you found. Okay. So we'll take a look at the data in a moment. So here is a study. This is done in fit Y by X just to, to illustrate. And overall, the cap is about 0.64. Not bad. In this particular study, it looks like these inspectors actually do have some inherent ability to rate the parts. And because of that, you're seeing there's good agreement. OK, so let's go back to jump again. I'm going to just get out of. Uh, easier to just get out of PowerPoint slideshow. So let's see if we can find the data set. Surface defects. Hopefully it's in here. Surface defects. Okay. So um, I'm, I'm going to use fit Y by X just to show you that you don't, you can also do agreement studies in fit Y by X, or you can still do them uh, in uh, attribute um, gauge chart, which I've been using. Uh, with multiple categories, maybe fit Y by X is even more interesting, uh, but either can be used. Uh, the attribute gauge study, of course, is more specialized, so it gives you more uh, statistics that might interest you, especially for evaluation studies. But fit by Y by X also will do these types of studies. So I have technician one versus technician two. Okay. So we take a look at our mosaic plot. Nice way to compare distributions. And you can see, for instance, for uh, technician one, um, technician one and two got most of the B classifications correct. A small, a small like 7%, seven, one, seven percent, they uh, had a problem with misclassification to C. And I'm going to skip some of these. I'm just simplifying what's being displayed in the table, but you can look across. You can see that there is a fair amount of agreement. And also, I click on the top button. You have agreement statistics. Okay. So we have the kappa statistic is 0.64. Uh, there's actually an approximate uh, test. We haven't covered statistical testing. If you're familiar with it, it indicates, in other words, this is a significant um, level of agreement. 
Uh, and this Bowker symmetry, you don't have to worry about that. We don't. It's not widely used. Uh, so we'll just go with the Kappa statistic, and just to show you, you can also do it in the quality and uh, process variability chart. Here, wafer has to be defined as the grouping variable. Put in the two technicians. Okay. And again, you get the inter-rater agreement. Okay. This time, it's slightly different. I'm not sure why. Sometimes it, it makes a slight adjustment. I'm not sure what it did. But you can look down through. And it also breaks it down by category. I don't know how important that is. Um, but overall, there is a well, there is actually I see there's a missing category. There might be a missing observation. But in any case, you can see there does appear to be at least um, some uh, substantial agreement between the raters. Okay, so we would say uh, above 0.6, we would say it's a substantial. Okay, the last part of this I'm not actually going to discuss. Okay, get it down here. Sometimes you have uh, rating systems where instead of classifying, you rate them on some, uh, it's often called a Likert scale, L-I-K-E-R-T. Um, and you do the ratings. You can still use the Kappa statistic if you want to. Uh, there's nothing te technically wrong with it, but you can sometimes do other types of analyses. Again, I'm not going to get into this um, because there's there's no uh, totally agreed upon method for ordinal uh, attribute MSA. Most people simply treat it um, as uh, regular nominal data, but I just would mention to you that uh, you can run into the situation whether the ratings are ordinal. Sometimes there's a little more you can do. And that ends our discussion of attribute MSA.